Path of the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, welcome to today's training, Use and Measurement of Mass Flux and Mass Discharge. Today's training was developed by the ITRC team, the Integrated DNAPL Site Strategy Team. My name is Juliana Cheatham. I'm coming to you from Moscow, Idaho. I'm going to serve as a moderator on today's course. I'm going to cover introductory material in the next few slides and then quickly turn the presentation over to our trainers from the ITRC team. Today's training is based on the ITRC uh, technical overview document of the same name, Use and Measurement of Mass Flux and Mass Discharge. We're going to introduce you to the document during today's training class, and we do hope that it becomes a resource that you can use on the job after today's training. Today's class is sponsored by the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, ITRC, and is hosted by the US EPA Cleanup Information Network, or CLUIN. A few housekeeping items to cover. Today's course is two and a quarter hours. We are recording the event. The trainers are going to control the slides today on our Adobe Connect. If you would like to, you can download the presentation, and that's available on that Clue-In training page where we started today. We do look for your questions and feedback. Throughout today's training, you are welcome to send in a question anytime using the Q&A box in the lower right. In some cases, we'll get right back to you with an answer. In other cases, we're going to ask those questions out loud during our question and answer breaks. We're going to have one in the middle and another at the end of today's training. At the end of the class, we do ask that everyone fill out the feedback form. We really do use your feedback. We're developing new classes now, and your feedback is going to help us improve those training classes. Plus, we can use your feedback to improve this training class as well. The feedback form is also your opportunity to create a certificate of participation for attending today's class. So if you're interested in a certificate, attend the class, fill out the feedback form, be sure to check the box at the bottom to certify that you attended. And that's going to allow the system to generate a certificate for you. More information about ITRC is available on the ITRC website. ITRC is hosted by the Environmental Council of States. And overall, ITRC is a network that's led by state regulators. It includes our federal partners, Department of Energy, Defense, and the Environmental Protection Agency, as well as members from industry, academia, and community stakeholders. The full ITRC disclaimer is included in the notes section of this slide and on the ITRC website. ITRC is partially funded by the U.S. government. ITRC nor U.S. government warranty material or endorse specific products. We recommend you check with local, state, and federal laws and experts. We encourage you to use ITRC's presentations and documents for educational purposes, both in your work and if you need to deliver training to others. We do ask that you please credit ITRC, review the ITRC usage policy, and let us know about your successes. Use of ITRC materials for profit is not permitted. More information is available on the ITRC website, which is linked here. There's a wide variety of technical and regulatory guidance documents. We have our classroom and online schedule for the rest of the year available. There's new teams that are starting in 2018. So if you'd like to become more involved in ITRC, please visit the website to learn about how you can become more involved and use the resources that are already available. I'll introduce our trainers for today's class. All trainers were members of the ITRC Integrated DNAPL Site Strategy Team. That team was led by Najia Gladys of the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Alex McDonald is a senior engineer in the technical support section of the cleanup unit at the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board in Rancho Cordova, California. He primarily works on cleanup of the Aerojet site in Rancho Cordova and other nearby sites such as McKellen Air Force Base. Dr. Tamsin McBeth is a Vice President at CDM Smith in Helena, Montana. She specializes in the development, demonstration, and application of innovative, cost-effective technologies for contaminated groundwater. Dr. Chuck Newell is Vice President of GSI Environmental in Houston, Texas. His professional expertise includes site characterization, groundwater modeling, non-aqueous phase liquids, risk assessment, and software development. Alec Noggle is a senior engineering geologist in the Groundwater Protection Division at the California Regional Water Quality Control Board, San Francisco Bay Region. He leads a unit that oversees solvent and petroleum hydrocarbon cleanups at Department of Energy laboratories and closed military bases. I'll now turn today's presentation over to Alex McDonald at the California Water Board. Alex? Thanks, Juliana. Uh, good morning or good afternoon to all of you out there, depending on where you're uh, sitting at your desk. Um, like most of you, I've been involved in soil and groundwater pollution cleanup projects uh, for a number of years. I think I'm going on uh, year 34 now. Um, and one thing I wish I'd had back when I first started is all the knowledge and everything I've gained since then to, to be able to apply it back then. It would make your job a whole, whole heck of a lot easier. And 
And what you see, what we're going to give you today is going to, we believe, is going to actually make your job easier. And I wish I had had this um, back then. Um, today, with this, the integrated Dean Apple Site Strategy Team is going to bring you this information, and it's another tool in your cleanup toolbox that you can use. And even though it's, if you look at um, Mass Flux is being com coming to you from the Dean Apple team, you, we want to make sure that the use of Mass Flux can be and should be applied to cleanup sites, not just those associated with Dean Apple. Um, the concepts and approaches presented today can also be used as sites polluted by non-VOCs, such as salts, uh, metals, nitrates, and other kind of those kind of contaminants. In fact, in in our office here, our, our dairy program is looking at using uh, the, these concepts and establishing groundwater monitoring programs at at, the, at dairy facilities throughout our valley. Um, let's move to slide six. Um, so, what are we going to try to teach you today? Well. Looking at this slide, we have eight bullets, and we're, we're going everything from the, the really simple concepts of what is mass flux and mass discharge, and why are those metrics useful, and how, they, how can you apply them. Um, we're going to show you how these mass flux and discharge um, measurements can be used in, in conjunction with con conventional concentration-based measurements, such as uh, groundwater data from monitoring wells. Um, we're going to show you what, how, to, what, how to actually take these measurements and how to calculate those discharges, um, how the existing site data, you might not even have to go out and gather additional data, but existing site data, depending on uh, the needs at your facility, can be used to estimate fl mass flux and mass discharge. And as with any component, there's uncertainty, and we're going to tell you how to ma manage that uncertainty. And lastly, there's regulatory considerations with using mass flux and discharge estimates, which you know haven't been used significantly in the past at um, cleanup type sites. Go to slide seven. So on, the, on this slide, you see on, on the right-hand side of the, of the screen, the, our, the, the breakout of the pie chart showing how, what's our, what are the components of our, our team. And it's probably not like any, it's like every other uh, ITRC team is that composed of people from the, the state governments, uh, federal agencies, community stakeholders, university, and then the biggest component is industry, the consultants and manufacturers out there that, um, that come to us and bring good information that help us uh, write these documents. And if you look on the, you know, the document we're bringing to you today is the use and measurement of mass flux and mass discharge. We've been doing this training since 2010, so we've been doing it for quite a while now. And since that time, our team has also put together a number of other documents. Uh, the first three here you see in situ by me uh, was done prior to mass flux, and then we've also produced one since that, that I highly recommend is the integrated DNAPL site strategy document. And then since that time, we've put out a DNAPL site strategy and tool selection document. And currently, the last thing that should be coming out by the end of this year is a uh, characterization remediation of fracture rock. Uh, it's an online uh, document that you'll be able to, to use with training coming out later, in, um, probably in early 2018. Go to slide eight. <clears throat> so why would you want to use this overall uh, site document? Uh, you know, this, this document was crafted primarily to aid state regulation overseeing uh, remediation and contaminated sites, while also providing information to stakeholders, the regulated community, and also the consultants. Within the document, as summarized in today's presentation, there are sections, as depicted on this slide, um, that will guide you into how to apply mass flux concepts in all nearly all the phases of site remediation, from you know looking at site characterization to remedy design, <clears throat> to establishing a monitoring program, and potentially prioritizing prioritizing between sites in order to optimize resources and address the biggest threats. We are presenting this training in, in three sections: uh, concepts and measurements, application, and then finally case studies. Move to slide nine. Um, mass flux is not an entirely new concept, but has been been used that much. It hasn't been used that much in a formal manner in the past of dealing with cleanup sites. It's used less formally in assessing sites and designing treatment systems, but not in established cleanup objectives and or, or other regulatory measures. Um, this is beginning to change as seen when a mass flux was used to, a few years ago to establish a goal for a cleanup at a, in a record of decision at a federal Superfund site. We'll be discussing that site a little bit more in detail in, in, later in the training. Um, mass flux, however, has been used extensively in other regulatory programs for quite a while now. Uh, as an example, in the regulatory realm of surface water, which I deal with from time to time, 
under the MPDS program, use mass flux to, is used to evaluate the impact on the surface water and to develop total maximum daily loads for pollutant discharges. So mass flux is not new to the regulatory program, but more or less new to the cleanup world. Um, mass flux has not had significant regulatory experience in many aspects of the cleanup program, and that's been due to a number of reasons. Um, there's uncertainty among many members of the regulatory community on how to relate to mass flux and exposure, or how to deal with some of the complexity and understanding in mass flux measurements. There's also uncertainty on how to use mass flux in a compliance framework of standard regulatory metrics, such as single point concentration measurements. Um, that's all changing slowly, and I think for the last six years since we've been giving these trainings, I think what we've seen um, many more applications of mass flux in, in our world. Um, this, do this document and and how we'll de uh, demonstrate in this training is how mass flux can be compatible and usable within their current regulatory uh, framework. Goes to slide 10. As we proceed through this training, we want to keep in mind the questions posed on the, on the far right, uh, excuse me, the left side of the slide, uh, the slide and we'll provide the answer to some of the, those questions as we go through the training. So keep that in mind as we go through the training, these questions that we're going to look at here on the left. Um, why should I estimate mass flux and discharge at my site? Uh, how is mass flux discharged or calculated? The figure on the right-hand side of the slide shows uh, the generic concept of mass flux calculation, and we'll be covering that in a little more detail a little bit later. Um, what are the cost benefits of using mass flux, and can mass flux help compliance, measure compliance? Well, this can actually occur if you actually set up your compliance measurements to include a mass flux component. Um, the use of mass flux will expand upon later in the, in the upcoming integrated DNAVL site strategy document that we uh, encourage you to have training. We actually had a training on that last week. And so probably we'll have another one or two of those probably in 2018 for you to, to jump on that. But make sure you go to the, go to the ITRC website and download that document because it does give you additional information on application of mass flux. <coughs> Finally, um, near the end of today's presentation, here looking at slide 11, we will have several case studies that show how mass flux has been applied at sites across the country to help remediate sites more effectively. So stay alert through the next uh, several excellent presentations to better understand mass flux and see how it can be applied in similar ways that help Re Reese Air Force Place, as is shown on this on the slide here, sig significantly address its groundwater contamination, as evidenced by the plumes shrinking over time after application of mass flux um, measurements. With that, I will be turning the training over to the capable hands of Tamsin Macbeth. Thanks, Alex. So uh, as Alex said, we've got this course broken up into several pieces. And this first is what we call mass concept. So we're going to take a step back, and we're going to define what we mean when we say mass flux and mass discharge, and kind of lay the foundation for understanding these metrics the basics about the calculations and their usages, um, and then before we talk about the actual methods and how to, how to measure these things. So first we're going to ask ourselves the question, why do we care? Why would we want to implement or use or understand mass flux and mass discharge, and how is it different than what we typically do, which is measuring groundwater concentrations? The team talked a lot about this, you know, really looking at how we could use these metrics and the, the utility and whether we really wanted to write an entire guidance document on it. And we really found there's really a lot of advantages to looking and building a conceptual site model that's focused on mass flux and mass discharge. It allows you to understand how the plume and the sources, for instance, are really impacting your receptors, things like municipal supply wells or uh, ecological or environmental receptors like rivers, because most of the time when we're doing things like risk calculations, inherently those calculations are actually using a discharge or the total amount of contaminant or chemical mass that is impacting that receptor. And so by directly linking the risk with how we're looking at the plume and the source, you know, can allow you to do things like develop meaningful performance metrics if you're looking at doing source treatment and defining interim objectives for active treatment technologies like in-situ thermal or in-situ bio. 
Um, it also is really the basis for not just our risk calculations, but it's also the basis for modeling. A lot of the fate and transport models, both analytical and numerical, are really already calculating mass flux and mass discharge, and then we're using those models to back calculate often concentrations or predict concentrations at a particular point in time. And really we're saying there's a lot of advantage, advantages to really looking at it at the mass flux level. So the other element that's really advanced a lot and made these metrics I think available and useful for general consumption within the industry is that there's a lot of tools and techniques that you can use to actually take these measurements. And so that's really helped advance the use of these metrics. So first we're going to go through some basic definitions. What is mass flux? What is mass discharge? So if we have a source and we have a plume, what you want to do is draw a line, if you will, that transects that plume. It goes clear across the plume from edge to edge. So you've got groundwater moving through that transect. This is your line in the sand. Um, and when you look at mass flux, flux is the rate that a chemical or solute is moving across a specific area um, over time. So this is essentially the vector. This is the rate that those, that chemical is moving. So it has a direction um, as well as a magnitude. And so if we then take all these, we've got little boxes here drawn, and we sum up all the fluxes and we integrate those across that entire transect area, that gives us mass discharge. So mass discharge is the total mass of that solute that's migrating across this plane. So mass flux typically is in units of mass per unit area per unit time, and discharge is in units of mass per time. So this is the loading rate of that chemical across that transect. And so just to highlight that some more, here again we've got our source. If we look at drawing a bunch of these transects as we move down gradient from that source, looking at groundwater flux or flow and the total mass of chemical moving across these transects, here you've got groundwater discharge, which is Q. So when we calculate chemical mass discharge, we're taking the groundwater discharge, Q, and we're simply multiplying it by the concentration, uh, either summed across multiple areas, you know, or that total, you know, average concentration across that entire transect. You can calculate it a variety of ways, and, and Chuck Newell is going to talk a lot about that. Um, and so, again, you get this milligrams per day. So why would we want to think about a plume in terms of mass flux and mass discharge? And one of the most significant advantages when we look at using this metric compared to concentrations is that it allows you to really understand how significant your sources and your plume are relative to a particular receptor. So in this case example, we've got a very large source area We've got a very significant plume migrating off of that source and coming into this receptor, which in this case is this extraction well. In case B, we have a very small source area. We have a very small, discrete plume. It's also being transported to this receptor and impacting the receptor. Now, if you are to place a well in the middle of that plume and, and take a groundwater sample and get a concentration, the concentration that you measure in this case will be equivalent. And so if you're just using concentration data, what that's going to tell you or suggest is that this source and this plume is the same as this one. If you look at it in terms of a discharge, it's clear that the total amount of mass that's emanating from this source and reaching this receptor and impacting this receptor. So the total grams per day of mass that's coming into this extraction well is much greater in case A. And so that really allows you to look at these sources and these plumes in different ways and perhaps make some different and important decisions about 
remedial actions. So mass discharge versus the traditional approach of just taking groundwater samples and evaluating concentrations. In all cases, uh, you can do things like evaluate impacts on receptors, calculate natural attenuation, and understand or evaluate different remedial options. But the team collectively agreed that mass discharge very often facilitates a better understanding of the site, of the risks to receptors, of degradation and attenuation of chemicals that overall can really lead to better uh, decision making during the course or the life cycle of that remedy. So here's uh, just some specific details about doing these calculations again. Here we've got our mass flux. So in this case, we're taking the specific discharge, which is Q. Um, this is also called the Darcy velocity. And that's really where you're taking the horizontal hydraulic conductivity and you're multiplying it by the hydraulic gradient. And so what that gives you is it gives you a volume um, per area per day. Now, it's important that you use the right discharge term. Very often, people try to use specific, um, or sorry, try to use seepage velocity. And that's where, really where you're taking the specific discharge and you're dividing it by the porosity. You don't want to do that. This calculation is based on kind of pipe flow. And so we're looking really at the volumetric discharge rate. So you want to use specific discharge or Darcy velocity in the calculation. Then again, you take concentration. And again, multiply those two things. And that gives you your contaminant mass flux, in this case, in grams per meter squared per day. So why do we care about mass flux? And again, how can this really help us understand our plumes better? One thing that can be very significant is we're often conceptualizing our sources in our plumes as these really nice kind of horizontal plan view isoconcentration contours that are very uniform, you know, migrating out from this source. The difference is that when we add the vertical dimension and we start looking at the subsurface geology and the geologic impacts, we have things like stratification of soils and sediments that create layers or zones that vary in permeability or hydraulic conductivity. And so what you will see is that when we look at groundwater flux, so how fast groundwater is moving through these systems, it's going to move a lot faster through our high permeability zones compared to our low permeability zones. And that's illustrated here by the size of these arrows, where the larger the arrow, the, the greater the groundwater flux. And you also have variations in contaminant concentrations. In this case, we're using this gradient where high concentrations are dark red and low concentrations are light red or peach. So what you have when we look at this vertical dimension is areas where we have very high groundwater flux and very high concentrations resulting in significant ground or contaminant mass flux compared to other areas where you might have much lower groundwater flux, but you still have those high concentrations, but you have lower contaminant mass flux. So understanding this vertical dimension and the variability in both the flow characteristics and the flux characteristics can really help, especially with remedial design, and we'll talk about that in the case studies. So to illustrate this point further, here we have this conceptual example of these three stratigraphic units. We've got a fine sand, a gravelly sand, and a regular sand. In this case, we're looking at the sensitivity of this mass flux calculation um, based on the horizontal hydraulic conductivity, where that fine sand is about one meter per day, the gravelly sand is 33 meters per day, and the regular sand is five meters per day. In this case, we're assuming the horizontal hydraulic gradient is the same for each of those three units. And we're also assuming the concentration of contaminant is the same. So in this case, just this difference in conductivity results in over 85% of the contaminant mass flux 
is actually occurring in that gravelly sand. So you can really see how this is starting to help us better understand the flow characteristics and the transport of these chemicals within these subsurface environments. So one of the things that is important to understand is when we're doing these kinds of measurements is that, especially for the transect method, which Chuck will talk about in detail, they, it relies on interpolation or really evaluating or estimating the change in concentration between measured points. So of course, the more data you have, the more points that you're collecting these measurements, the more accurate the estimates of mass flux and mass discharge are going to be. So here you can see we've got this transect, we've got these multi-port sampling wells, we're collecting samples. This is the conceptual uh, idea or visual of what that plume looks like if you're looking into the contaminant plume with these high concentration hot spots and we take these measurements and we interpolate, this is what we're getting. So in this case, it's important to understand variability and the uncertainty in these measurements and understand that the majority of transects are really sampling very small overall percentages of groundwater moving through the transect. So the other important element of using mass flux and mass discharge is really understanding how these concepts can help us interpret what's going on in contaminant plumes and where chemical mass is migrating and where it's being stored. And an important evolution in our understanding of denapple plumes in particular is concept of matrix diffusion. So in our ITRC document in this one and then in a number of them that we've published subsequent, including the integrated denapple site strategy document and the site characterization documents, we talk a lot about plumes and the life cycle of a plume where you've got an early stage where you might have a, here a high concentration source. This probably has some denapple. So you're dissolving out very high concentrations from that denapple that the concentrations of that plume is advancing in your high conductivity zone. So if you've got these transects that are periodically placed in down gradient of that source, this early time frame you've got the high concentrations migrating through your high conductivity zones, that plume is expanding. But because there is a difference in concentration at these interfaces where you've got high concentrations and then low concentrations and the lower permeability media around that, you've got matrix diffusion occurring, meaning that mass, chemical mass, is diffusing into those low conductivity zones. So you've got mass migrating advectively as the plume front advances, and you've got contaminant mass migrating through diffusion, creating these halos, if you will, around these high conductivity zones. And you can see the halos better in this figure. When we look at denapple sites in particular, um, and the fact that they're very often have been present for decades, a lot of sites are what we would consider a late stage or late phase site. And in this case, that source is largely gone or depleted. So you've had many, many pore volumes of groundwater flushing through this source, or perhaps you did some remediation in this case. And so sometimes you can get this similar effect if you remove that source. And so what happens is now you've got clean groundwater migrating through these high conductivity zones um, and the majority of the remaining mass is actually stored in those low conductivity zones. So because you've reversed that concentration gradient, now you're going to have concentrations or chemical mass back diffusing from your low permeability zones into your high conductivity zones. So this is why for these kinds of plumes, we very often see significant tailing in our contaminant concentration data over time, meaning we can get to some low concentrations and have a lot of, of impact in remediating our sources, but then it's very difficult often to get down to these very low part per billion concentrations, and often it's because of this diffusion effect and that this mass uh, can essentially act as a secondary source of contamination for a very long time. 
so that's important to understand. Uh, the other concept that really is helped by understanding mass flux and mass discharge um, are things, again, like our natural attenuation models. Very often those models are geared towards evaluating the differences in mass discharge across transects in different parts of the plume, where that reduction in discharge, if you go from you know, 400 grams per day of mass at a transect close to your source, oh, let me see, here to say, you know, uh, 10 grams per day in a transect out here, that difference in mass discharge is often what's used to estimate the attenuation capacity of that aquifer system. Um, the other kind of important element and something we've been doing a lot is really looking at ex situ treatment systems and pump and treat systems in particular because those systems are designed to create capture zones and to bring capture those plumes and bring that mass into extraction wells, which you can see here, you know, capture this plume, bring it into the extraction wells. So that is almost entirely discharge based. You're creating those capture zones, you're pumping the groundwater, and you're bringing that chemical mass into the extraction wells. So we very often, when we're looking at optimizing these pump and treat systems, and EPA in 2002 actually published an interesting overview document of optimi optimizing 20 pump, evaluating and optimizing 20 pump and treat sites. Um, and what they found is if you looked at this, the capture zones that were being created and the mass that was coming in to these extraction wells and looked at where within the plumes that mass was coming from, what they found is that in general, the, the treatment systems, these pump and treat systems, very often had to be replaced or optimized, and it was very often because they were over-designed, meaning they were capturing these tremendous volumes of water, um, and they were doing a good job of capturing their plume, but it was very inefficient. And by optimizing those treatment systems and really refining those capture those extraction intervals, and in particular, the vertical intervals. Again, because you've got all this heterogeneity, really honing in on those zones that uh, where the contaminant plume is allowed for much more efficient operation of those pump and treat systems. So that can be really helpful when you're looking um, at those kinds of things. So our team thought a lot about these metrics. Um, we thought a lot about the good, the bad, the ugly. And essentially what we came up with is one of the biggest uh, hindrances to using these metrics is that there's a lot of uncertainty. So now you are dealing with not just uncertainty of groundwater concentrations and collecting samples, but there's also uncertainty with things like taking hydraulic conductivity measurements, taking gradient measurements, making sure those data are accurate. And the team agreed that that uncertainty is there, but really these systems are inherently uncertain. And by implementing these approaches in an adaptive manner that allows you to update and refine these estimates throughout the life cycle of the remedy, that uncertainty can be managed. Um, and that kind of leads to, again, this idea of heterogeneity and sample volumes and really just understanding, you know, doing some preliminary estimates per perhaps with a preliminary transect can give you a certain estimate with uncertainty and then as you refine or modify or progress through the remedy, you can update that and improve those estimates over time. Um, the source plume boundary. Uh, this is really where these estimates can be very helpful when you're trying to really look at, do I still have a significant bean apple source, um, or am I more this late stage site where the fusional or secondary sources, even desorption, is really what's driving uh, chemical mass into the plume. So overall, we feel that these metrics give you some solutions so you can work smarter, so you can implement more adaptive approaches so you can account for and include things like heterogeneity and variability and flow and transport, and again, make the better decisions for the site. So the advantages, better conceptual site models, better estimates of attenuation capacity, improved remedial efficiency, 
uh, reduced remediation timeframes because you're being much more strategic and, and informed about where you're doing remediation, accounting for the fact that you're going to have to manage uncertainty and there is a cost implication with these metrics. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Chuck Newell with GSI Environmental, and he's going to go through measurement methods. Well, great. Thanks, Tamsin. And we'll go ahead and start and, and uh, talk about this key question. You're, say, staring at your, your site report, and you want to add this information. You want to add that this plume has a mass discharge of X milligrams per day. But, but how do you get that number? And that's what this section is really about, and in the section four in the document. Uh, there's five methods that we talk about here, and um, but some of the key points that we have is, is that all these points, they're all ready to go. Um, you can apply them at your site. You can apply them in different places in the, in the source or, or in the plume itself. And they all have different characteristics in terms of their, their cost and the type of data that you can get from them. But here are the five right now. Method one is this transect method um, that uh, you can use to apply it. Method two, well captured pumping methods. Method three, passive flux meters. Method four, using data ISO, ISO contours. And method five, solute transport models. So I'll be going over most of these, spending most of the time on method one, which is the method we currently, uh, I think, is most applied to get this, this mass discharge type data. But how do you decide which one? And of course, your site may have different information about you know, cost or applications. But in, in our group, uh, the, in this, uh, the, the work group that developed the, the guidance, sort of tongue in cheek, we developed a way that there's also potentially some psychological factors. And depending on your personality type, you may have a different preference for one of these five methods. Well, let's go to the, uh, the next one, and the, or the first method, actually, we're going to talk about is uh, calculating mass discharge with a transect method. So who is this for? Well, it's for all of you out there who just really like going out there and doing groundwater sampling, because this is groundwater sampling on steroids. You get a lot of pleasure about putting on those steel-toed boots and that hard, ta hard hat, going out to that site, pumping that groundwater and filling up those 40 mil VOA vials then belling up to the airport counter uh, with that ice chest, and you're going to send that home, by send it back to the lab. So that's sort of the things that you like to do. And if you like that, being outside, getting the data, this method's for you. So how do you apply it? Um, we've got these five steps that you'd use. First is it's good to have some knowledge of the flow and the concentration out there, because step three, as Tamsin said, you're going to draw that line in the sand, this vertical transect uh, that's perpendicular to groundwater flow, and use that as your basis for the transect method. And what you're doing is you're going to build these different uh, polygons or cross-sectional polygons, what we call window panes in here. And here's a very simple example of these four different um, um, values that are in four different window panes and uh, different polygons, and two of them have got concentration. But you want to figure out what the width of these things are, what the depth of them are, and then you're going to put all this stuff together and multiply the, in each window pane the concentration times this area, width times the depth, times this flow that's going through there. And then sum up each window pane. In this case, there are just two of them. And then with that, you can get this mass discharge that's flowing through this vertical curtain, this vertical transect that's going into the subsurface. So that's the calculation approach. Let's go to this in just a little bit more detail in terms of, of the flow term this, uh, this, uh, that's in here. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. But where do you get this? And so basically, this is just a, what we call a Darcy velocity, it's sometimes called a, a specific discharge. But we're going to take the hydraulic conductivity times this gradient. And then with that, you can get this Darcy velocity in terms of, uh, say, feet per, for, uh, feet per day, some unit like that. Um, uh, where are you going to get hydraulic conductivity? You can get this from pumping tests, from slug tests, um, even estimate from soil type and things of that nature. Gradient is going to come from potentiometric surface maps. But one key point here is since we're interested in just the flow, hey, don't use a porosity. Don't use a seepage velocity. Don't divide by the porosity. Because when the big guy, Henry Darcy, figured all this stuff up uh, initially in, in Dijon, France in the 1840s, he didn't think about porosity. He just used this entire cross-sectional area to do his flow calculations. So we're putting all this stuff in there. So that's where the flow term comes in. And just another note is that you can apply this if you just have a limited flow information where there's one value 
for this groundwater flow rate that's going through this transect for each one of your window panes. But with more and more high resolution sampling, uh, many people are then applying different flow rates for different window panes. And you can apply more and more of the stuff going in there. Um, let's just uh, do some couple of quick notes about building these transects and how you do this. Um, they can be permanent temporary installations. You can use Geoprobe and get individual points and then move on. They're going to be permanent wells. You don't need any special wells. This is just plain groundwater sampling on steroids. Um, they can be based on longer screened wells or multi-level observations where you have different depths. So you can have uh, rows of window panes out there. And we'll look at one example of that coming up pretty soon. But this transect must be perpendicular or close to perpendicular to the groundwater flow. If it's not, uh, you can use some trigonometry. SOCATOA is what I learned in middle school, you know, using um, uh, trigonometry to figure out that actual flow rate that's in there. Uh, next, um, just to give you some examples of doing this with high resolution data, and one of the members in the group, a couple of members, they talked about this is the re real beauty of this particular method, that if you do this high resolution sampling and you look at this mass flux, for example, going across multiple window panes in this figure to the right, he said it just changes your life. It changes your entire perspective of the site. You can see these high concentration um, sort of uh, uh, rivers of, constant, of high mass flux going through your site, and you can get an idea, oh, I start understanding the source architecture and things of this nature. So here's an example of a lot of window panes at the site. We've got different rows in here from this multi-level sampling that was done. In this particular example, you add them all up, you get this to be 488 grams per day, um, equal to 176 kilograms per year. Um, there's a classification system, a paper that I helped write in 2011 that puts all these plumes in 10 different buckets like the Richter scale. In this particular one, 408 grams per day, that's a MAG-7 plume that we're looking at right there. OK, well, let's keep going on and um, talking about the transect method. Um, how many points to use? Um, we talked a lot. Should we come up with specific guidance and say you should use X numbers? No, we just, in the end, we couldn't. It's very site specific. We did, got some qualitative information about if you're using it to estimate source strength, maybe you need fewer numbers. But if you're estimating plume stability, hey, maybe higher numbers for this. And so for all these different applications and the specific use, we have these uh, suggestions about, hey, low resolution, medium resolution, or high resolution. So all of that's in there to help you figure this out. We've got risk to receptors, selecting its appropriate technologies, develop optimized remedial design, evaluating remedial performance, long-term monitoring. So one thing about this table, it, it does say that th there is a lot of applications for this technology, this mass flux information, and uh, how many points as we talk about this on this table 1.1. How about multiple transects at a site? And we say, yeah, that's a great idea. You can really do this. And so this picture here talks about, in the beginning, we've got a plume in sort of all three of these zones. But by, by the time you get to transect three, there's only one. And so you can sort of craft these and, and, and look at these. But this multiple mass transects, you can look at these different things and get different sorts of first order rate constants, for example. John Wilson, the EPA now with scissor tail, talked about, hey, using this mass discharge data is really a great way to understand attenuation. And if you do mass discharge versus distance, you get an idea of how quickly that parcel of, of dissolved material is dissolving as it moves away from the source and sort of goes down gradient. If you're looking at one transect over time, you know, from this year, two years ago versus 10 years ago, you get indication of how quickly this source is weathering or attenuating in here. And this particular document here uh, from US EPA um, provides that, that uh, it sort of explains these different flavors of, uh, of uh, first order rate constants that you can use. Moving on, I'm going to talk about two related concepts and using pre-characterization with something like a membrane interface probe or some other screen tools. That might help you say, hey, I can sort of see this, this high concentration you know, uh, blob or this core. Maybe I'm going to put more of my, my, uh, my points and my transect in there. And then you so do this, and you can design sort of a more, more customized uh, uh, transect to get better, better information from it. And then there's uh, another concept that we talked about in our group, that site characterization can be different than long-term monitoring. And for site characterization, maybe that high resolution, a lot of vertical points, helps you understand that architecture. But maybe going on long-term monitoring, it's OK to use long screened wells 
you know, maybe three meters, something like that, um, where uh, it sort of averages all of that, but you're just tracking things, and you, you don't have to do as much sampling if you are, are averaging the concentrations with these long screen wells that are in there. So with that, just to give you a couple of tools that can be used, um, this is one that uh, um, is in the document where uh, this particular group uh, is, is um, integrating a, a CPT rig, a piece of cone, and a MIP, and they've got software which can slice and dice. Um, I don't know if this has been applied this much, but people are using a lot of techniques like this of getting all this high-resolution data, putting it together in one transect to see, see this mass flux and then calculate this mass discharge. Another tool, something I helped write, is the mass flux toolkit. It really should be called, based on what Tamsin said, the Mass Discharge Toolkit, but this was done sort of before the ITRC was out there. But it's free, and you can download here at, the, at this particular website. It's an Excel tool, and you go in here, and you can uh, add in um, um, your, put in your information, and then it will do a lot of things for you. So let's just take a, a further look at that. Streamlines the data input process. You can pick an interpolation method, does the calculations. It's got an uncertainty analysis, and then you can... Graphical output, it's got some description of how you use this data. Just overall a, a, a good resource for thinking about mass flux and mass discharge. And how does it work? Well, you just put in your input data, and you've got a monitoring point. It's a certain number of feet away from the edge of your transect. Here's the sampling interval, the vertical piece. And then in here, it will tell you what your concentration is. Then you're going to hit a button. Next step, complete the grid. And then it's going to give you, hey, here's this mass discharge in units of, uh, of grams per day. So let's wrap up here. In method one, advantages is commonly used. It's been used a lot as a direct measurement. It's an extension of accepted technology. But it can be costly, and the calculations can be time consuming. And so that's, that's what we have for method one. Well, let's say you're, you've got a different personality. And so um, method two is, is maybe for other people that are more, maybe more of a mechanical bent. And let's just say you really like pumps, all kind of pumps. Uh, you like bladder pumps, centrifugal pumps, jet pumps. Uh, top drive pumps, peristaltic pumps, but you like to put pumps in these wells and then you like to turn them on and you, you like to be the cowboy. You like to, to lasso and corral that plume and capture it and bring it into the well. And if you do this, pretty easy to get some mass discharge data from that. The idea is that if you know that you've captured this plume and you're pretty sure that you're not, um, say, uh, doing, you're not close to your source where you might be increasing the dilution from the source and you're at steady state, and you're pretty sure you've captured this thing, then all you got to do is on this well right in here, uh, have a flow meter that's going to give you liters per day, something like that. You're going to take a sample, milligrams per liter, and you can do the math, and you can get a mass discharge in grams per day. Let's just verify our, our units work here. So if I've got liters per day as a flow, and I've got this uh, concentration, let's say it's in grams per liter, cross them out, there it is. Yeah, there's mass discharge. Sure, it works. So a pretty simple way uh, that you can use to, to get this information with the existing pump and treat system. If you have multiple wells, you can sum these up. But the idea is I'm capturing all this, and I'm getting it all in one place, and then I'm, I'm doing two measurements, and I'm getting these numbers. There's some more uh, ways out there that uh, sort of more sophisticated uh, applications to it. You can do integral pump tests with multiple wells, and you look at the shape of some of these curves that are over here, concentration versus time, and then use an inverse modeling system to understand what that, what that uh, plume looked like. And so just ways to sort of fine tune it and sort of get this in there, not used as much as sort of the, your typical um, standard way that, that you're going to do this. Okay, well, let's wrap up the well pumping method and got some advantages and disadvantages for this. So let's take a look. It's a, it, fewer wells you need. You just need a couple of these pumping wells. A lot of people think it's a better integration of this flow and concentration data, and you can use an existing pumping system. Uh, limitations, you don't get that mass flux data. You don't get, don't get that, that world-changing picture of what that mass flux and see all that architecture in there. Uh, you got a lot of water you got to dispose of, and if you don't have an existing pump and treat system, that eh, can be costly. Uh, it's possible to change these plume characteristics, get too close to the source. Maybe you're dissolving stuff a little bit more than would naturally, and sometimes, and this is like something I've experienced, sometimes it's difficult to know, am I really capturing that whole thing, or is some of it getting to the side or below me? So that's it. Hmm. Well, let's go to method three. Who's this for? Well, method three, it's for everybody who's got the newest gizmo. Um, how many people out there have got the iPhone 8? Uh, this is for you because this is a relatively new technology, very clever technology done by uh, two professors at the University of Florida, and they said they're going to put a device down the well, 
and water, groundwater enters this well, and then it acts like a, one of those groundwater lenses. If you took any groundwater flow, then the water flows through this thing, and two things happen. The first is, uh, if you see up here in this picture, is that there's a permeable sorbent, and if you've got TCE or benzene or nitrate or a lot of other stuff, it will sorb on here, and if you leave this thing deployed for three weeks or four weeks, and you measure how much mass is in there, you can get a mass flux, milligrams per meter squared per second in here. So here's a dye they used, but you can sort of get this idea of this, this crescent-shaped accumulation that's in there. The second thing, they've got some soluble tracers, some alcohols and things of that nature. As the water flows through this porous uh, material in this, uh, in this meter, then some of these leave. By seeing how much is left, they can get a direct measurement of the Darcy velocity, very helpful for, for these type calculations. Um, here's just some pictures of it. Here's the, the two inventors, uh, Mike Annabelle, uh, Kirk Hatfield, two brilliant guys, but you can see it's a pretty simple thing to do. They're putting this particular meter just down in the well, and they're letting it sit there for a couple weeks, and you ship it off to the lab. There's a vendor that can do all this stuff for you. You get a spreadsheet back from them, and it says, you know, at different depths in here, you get a certain mass flux, milligrams per meter uh, uh, squared per day, and, and units like that, you can have all this in there. So here's some of the advantages and disadvantages of this. It's being used uh, um, um, a lot more for different things. Um, um, it, uh, just a quick note, is, uh, I talked to Dr. Annabelle uh, recently, and he says that there are over 200 sites that's been used, um, a wide range of Darcy velocities. Uh, they're using it for, for nitrate, and phosphorus, arsenic, um, looking at ethane. Uh, now they're trying to do it in fractured rock and sediment. So a lot of applications for it. And, and you can see why one of the advantages is it's a one-stop shop for getting both that flow and that concentration. It's easy to install in the field. There's no waste, and then this vendor's ready to go. Uh, you, you get that PO to them, and they'll get you these uh, these uh, equipment to put out in there. Limitations are some method-specific issues. It looked like there was some lower measurement if you use push wells, and so it, it does rely on some of these convergence calculations to understand that. Slight biodegradation of the tracer in one, at one site. There was some competitive absorption maybe going on, and it does rely on these convergence calculations, which can can sort of uh, um, you know be problematic or increase the uncertainty of this thing. But overall, I think just attributed to the ingenuity of of, the, of humans and just a, a pretty neat little gizmo out there that's, that that can be used to solve give you to give you the numbers you need for your report. Let's go to method four. Um, use existing data transects based on ISO contours. Uh, who is this for? Well, it's for you people who maybe the opposite of uh, method one. You sort of got a nice office or a nice cube, and it's close to the kitchen, and it's got a nice view, and you really don't like leaving your office. And so this is the method where you could sort of do this, apply this, this technology without leaving your office. And what do you do is you're going to get an existing plume, and you're going to draw these perpendicular transects with your engineering scale. And you're coming up with synthetic transects based on, on an interpreted plume map. I got to tell you, in our group, there was some spirited debate about this, and the high-resolution team—they were sort of saying, "This is this is crazy. This is just this, this is stupid. You can't do this. You can't really understand a plume unless you do high-resolution sampling." And this plume map's probably wrong. But overall, we said no. There is good information in this. Uh, you are able to get a picture of a plume map with long screen wells. You don't need to do high-resolution sampling everywhere. Hey, this is legit. And the way it works is you do, draw this line in there. And then there's some nuances to it, and you can do it a lot of different ways. But what I typically do is I put my edges of my window panes as the contour lines, 0.1 milligram per liter here, 0.1 and 1. And I take the geometric mean in the middle. A lot of times this groundwater data is log normally distributed. But that's the way you sort of get a concentration for a window pane in here. I think the next slide just goes to a little bit more examples of how this works. You've got these different concentrations. Here's the 5 ppb line, right? that's coming in this plume here. Here's the 10 ppb line here. I do a geometric mean. I get this, uh, this concentration of that window pane of 7. Then I get the width. Then I get the, 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 uh, the thickness. Then I go back to method 1. Use the mass flux toolkit, and bam, I can get this result and get these numbers in here. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of method 4? Um, the, the one that, uh, you know, if you like being close to that kitchen and there's a lot of good chow in there, it's, sometimes it's too hot or too cold outside. Um, hey, the advantages does not require a special steel study. You can just stay 
in your, your office and with that engineering scale and your, your Excel and MassFlux toolkit, you can do this. So limited additional expense, a lot of clients like that. Limitations, we say respectively, wide range of opinion about the usefulness of this method. But in the end, we give it a thumbs up. You can get useful information out of it. But we do put some caveats in there. It all depends on how confident you are of that plume. And, you know, if you've got a gas station site with only five wells, yeah, maybe it's not likely you're going to get <laughs> good data with this. But if you're at some wells and you've got 40 wells in that source zone, yeah, yeah. That, I think you can start really getting good information with that. You've done a lot of work understanding that. So that's method number four. One, one left, one personality. And this is for all you people who um, really like computers. You're like me. You, you bought the first Macintosh. Uh, maybe that's, that's in your mind. Uh, you know, when you watch Star Trek and you see the Borg, and you sort of relate to that somehow. You're really into this, this sort of network stuff. If you like computer and computer models, this is, the, this is the thing for you. And why does this work? Well, a computer model, automatically, a contaminant transport model integrates flow and concentration. So you calibrate a model. You get flow and concentration data against a transect, and then it will do this. And I'll give you an example from a model that I developed from, called BioScreen. And it's free from the US EPA. It's a, a spreadsheet model, and you can download this thing. And what it does is um, it, and the output is once you push this button, it will tell you here is this, this uh, really a mass discharge in milligrams per day for these different synthetic transects that are coming out of the model. So this is near the source. This is near the edge of the plume and it will tell you these numbers. And the story is pretty impressive because I was working on this model. I got a call again from Dr. John Wilson, a very famous EPA researcher, and says, I think you should put some of this, this mass flux stuff, and that's what we called it back then, in the model. And this was in 1996, a long time ago. And I said, well, John, why do we want to do that? He said, well, at some point in time, people are going to be real interested in that. Man, what a pressing call, and now we're given training on it. But here it is. This is really mass discharge. This is before we're sort of trying to get our, our nomenclature right, milligrams per day, but you run this model and you can see it and get these numbers out here because it is integrating that flow that you put as input data, integrating that concentration together and, and getting, in this case, a mass discharge against multiple transects. Um, here's a REMCOR model, sort of a really nice model by Ron Fault at Clemson. It's very mass discharge uh, um, uh, centric. Here's mass discharge in kilograms per year on the y-axis. Here's distance from the source. Here's what it looked like in 2008. Then we say 90% of the source mass, you can put that into this REMCOR model, was removed in 2010. Here's what the mass discharge looks after that. And so what you're seeing is near the source, the mass discharge is a lot lower because of that remediation project of the source, but you didn't do anything to the plume. And so you have one of these, what do you call it, you know, mouse going down the python thing but then it will tell you what the mass charge is at any, any point in time. So these models integrate this stuff, and that's one of our key points. We have a list of these different ones that sort of do this. There's a RT flux module that if you're into numerical models that you can use. Remcor is, uh, and rem fuel is out, so those can be real useful for doing that. So just to wrap up here, I think what we've got is um, advantages and limitations um, that we have you know, to, the, to the particular method. Um, you don't need a special field study. You can use existing historical data from existing monitoring programs. And these models, this is what they do. They combine flow and concentration data. Hey, it's helpful to have some experience in training and using this. So definitely some classes or working with somebody who's used them before. There is some, some uh, element of you know, uh, experience that can help you get through some of this stuff. And there's the garbage in, garbage out. You need good data, flow and concentration data. And the amount of data depends maybe what information that, that you have and what's being used in there. So that's method five. And I hope that covers all the main personality types of the folks we have in here. We're just summarizing method one was a transect. It's commonly used. It's based on familiar technology. Number two, most pump and treat systems are doing this right now. Method three, new technology, easy to install, you know, one-stop shop for that, uh, that mass flux information. Method four, uh, let's use existing data ice and contours but you have to need a good monitoring network. Method five, let's run out the models. They automatically do this stuff. So if you've got a good solute transport model, you can get that mass flux, mass discharge information. And so with that, I think we're ready to, to go on um, uh, to the uh, continue. But first, we're going to do a question and answer break, I think. And um, we're here to answer any questions about anything we've talked about so far. Thanks, Chuck. If you're on the phone line, you're welcome to unmute and ask questions out loud, pound six. But most people are going to send those questions using that Q&A pod. 
in the lower right. So you're welcome to send in uh, your questions now. We also have a poll question for your, uh, the group as we're uh, taking questions. Which methods for measuring mass discharge are you likely to use? And you're welcome to select more than one. So Chuck's talk about the different methods uh, during the previous section. And let's hear from our audience. And we have that set so as people are filling out this poll, you can see the answers from other people in the audience. I'll also point out in our related links, the third item down, additional resources. Uh, at the beginning, Alec talked about the other documents available from the ITRC teams related to DNAPLES. Those are available in the additional resources page. And just now we talked about those, the models for the mass flux and mass discharge estimates. And we do have a list of those models in the additional resources, and those do link to where you can get those models. So this is uh, something that you may be interested in following up with at the end of today's class. Also a reminder, we do use your feedback. So please fill out the feedback form. If you leave before you wrap up, in the related links, fourth item down, you select feedback, then you select go down a bit, select browse to. And that's going to open that in a new window for you. And we do appreciate you taking just a few minutes to give us your feedback because it is something that we use. The feedback form is also your opportunity to create a certificate of participation for attending today's class. So if you want a certificate for attending, be sure to attend the class. Complete the feedback form. Check the box at the bottom to certify that you attended. And if that box is checked when you submit, the system is going to generate that certificate for you. So right now, the only way to get the certificate is by attending the class, checking the box to certify, and then submitting. And that's going to create a certificate for you. We don't have any questions that have come in yet, but uh, I do want to give us a little bit more time for people to give us some questions. So while we're waiting, can our trainers tell us about the new ITRC teams that's focused on fractured rock? Sure. So this is Tamsin. Um, so subsequent to this mass flux guidance, we actually developed a training called Integrated DNAPL Site Strategy, which is kind of an overarching framework for how to manage complex sites um, with specific focus on DNAPLs, but the process that we put forward uh, can be used really for any contaminated site, arguably. Um, as a key component of that, we recognized it was very important and one of the things that was often missing and really hurting many sites and management programs' ability to clean up sites was inefficient, insufficient conceptual site models. So we implemented a, a new team and we wrote a guidance document on doing site characterization and really which was originally kind of an update to a Dean Apple site characterization document that was published in the early 2000s. And as part of doing that, we recognized that, you know, there was so much complexity and so many nuances with working in fractured rock sites that we just really couldn't capture or, or sufficiently address in that site characterization guidance, the general one, we wrote a guidance document specifically on um, doing site characterization for fractured rock. So we're wrapping that up. That document should be released this year with the associated trainings. And so it really is, you know, how do you characterize and build efficient and effective conceptual site models for fractured rock sites. Thank you. We actually haven't had any questions come in, so we'll just go ahead and keep this question and answer break short. For people who are, have questions, you're welcome to send those in during the second half of the training class. And we should have time at the end now to answer a lot of questions at the end of the class. But for now, we'll continue on with the second half of today's training. And I'm going to turn it over to Alec Noggle at the California Water Board. Alec? Uh, thank you, Juliana. Uh, yes, I'm, my name is Alec Noggle. I'm with the California Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, at this point, what you've heard is Tamsin explain the concepts and Chuck uh, described the methods for mass flux and mass discharge. What I want to do in the next thir 13 slides is discuss the applications for mass flux and, uh, and mass discharge and discuss some of the regulatory point of view about this. So as you listen, 
consider your own experience with regulatory acceptance of these concepts. And then at the end, uh, I'll close with a slide or two about my thoughts on that. Okay, so we are on, moving on to slide uh, 56. Yeah, okay, sorry. That's the course roadmap, slide 57. What we had to start with um, when we first, as Tamsin discussed, back in 2000, 9, 2010 timeframe, that's when we considered writing this document on mass flux, mass discharge. So we kind of had to start with a literature review of how, how mass flux, mass discharge are being applied or were being applied at that time to kind of give us a, you know, a baseline. So we conducted a review of 65 case studies and uh, from 1995 through 2009 at that time. And basically we, we lumped all the findings into these six categories. For the, for the application of mass flux and mass discharge. Uh, categories one, uh, excuse me, yeah. one, three, and, and uh, four here are the most common ones that we found being uh, applications being used in the literature. Category one is called site characterization. And as you can see over on the right, there are several uh, sub applications that we've, we've lumped together as site characterization. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a couple. For example, it includes determining baseline mass discharge, which a lot of people were using it for that and still are using it for that purpose. This allows you to quantify changes that might occur uh, due to future remediation. So again, it, that baseline was very important, and I think people realize this early on, that if we're going to use this, this concept of mass flux or mass discharge, you're probably going to want to use it in a way to document how it changes based on what you do. So establishing a baseline, we lump that into the site characterization um, um, category. Now keep in mind, if you measure mass discharge across two parallel transects that are perpendicular to flow, then the difference is really a very good estimation of the attenuation rate over that area. There is one caveat, and it assumes that the rates of sorption and desorption, or what's moving in and out of storage, contaminant storage, is in relative equ equilibrium. So you're not just um, seeing changes due to sorption or desorption. You're actually seeing uh, what we call attenuation or destruction. Um, the site characterization category also includes identifying hot spots um, as, uh, where, where, where most of the mass is flowing, contaminant mass is flowing, rather than just finding the highest concentrations. Now using mass flux during site characterization also sets up your remediation, selection, and design, and, uh, and, the, and the best methods for how you're going to um, monitor performance. And that's the categories three and four. So obviously, you're going to want to target the highest mass flux zones. Uh, these are your priority source areas. So measuring the mass discharge reduction um, as, as, uh, is, is really, I think, a wonderful remedial action objective. And it complements simple uh, concentration monitoring to look at reductions in concentration. So reduction of mass discharge over time is really, I think, a, a very effective and powerful um, remedial performance metric. Categories two, five, and six on this slide are perhaps better considered emerging it, it uses, or at least at that time frame when we did the case studies, started this concept, we thought, um, you know, these are not as well known. It's, they're not as well documented in the literature, but um, we do see the usefulness here. So category two refers to assessing a potential uh, threat to a receptor, such as a surface water body or, a, say, a water supply well, where a plume may be discharging or threatening to discharge. And I'm going to discuss an example of how that might work a little bit later. Category five, this refers to using mass discharge as a re regulatory metric for compliance. So not only now performance monitoring, but for compliance, the kind of stuff that that I, as a regulator, am looking to uh, to see how effective is it. Uh, one example is to use it as a trigger to change a remedy, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, perhaps from an active remedy to a passive remedy like monitored natural attenuation, for example. Category six refers to using mass discharge for site prioritization. So if you're a consultant, it can help you prioritize among multiple sources that you have on your on your project. You might want to determine the source strength and the threat potential, so you know you can recommend what what uh, source should you should go after um, first. If you're a regulator, then maybe you want to use mass discharge to help prioritize among multiple sites. 
that are in your you know, programmatic portfolio. How many of these sites are really high threat? Um, I'm always doing public participation, public communication, so it's really important to be able to communicate these things to other parties um, that, in the community and, as to why things are taking time, why priorities are the way they are. So, all right, moving on to slide 57, I'm sorry, 58. What this simply shows is that there has been a rapid increase in the use of mass flux and mass discharge. This is based on those 65 case studies that we reviewed from that time period since 1995. Now we believe it's largely due to a growing desire for better characterization and, and more efficient remedies. A lot of do-overs, and I hate to use the word, the F word, failure, but uh, you know that, that has happened out there, and we have a history of that. So I think we, we've seen people looking for better tools to, uh, to uh, um, you know, provide, get to better successes, and that's probably what this graph is showing. And we're hof hopefully, hopeful that it does single a trend, resulting in greater use and greater regulatory acceptance. Um, and uh, I've been talking with Grant Carey of Poor Water Solutions, who, who helped us with this, and uh, about what this chart might look like if it were extended through through today. Um, we are confident that the bar for the say the last five years or so, seven years, would would also be much taller. So um, unfortunately, that is that's a, a work in progress. We hope to add that at a future date to really update this, but uh, we think it's moving in the right direction. Slide 59. Again, from those 65 case studies that we reviewed, this slide shows how they broke, how they broke down by category. I sort of already talked about this. The difference is that uh, I showed you six categories earlier. Uh, we, here we lumped them into five. We basically combined categories three and four into remediation, since it was often difficult to tease them out. Um, so I'm not going to say much more about that. This slide shows where in the world mass flux and mass discharge were being used at that time where these 65 case studies came from. Um, the good news is that we believe the interest in mass discharge is worldwide. We certainly, our team has been reaching out to a lot of researchers in, researchers in Europe and, and Australia and other places. So we think this bodes well for spreading familiarity and regulatory acceptance, which is really one of the major goals of, of our guidance. It also supports the idea that uh, mass discharge, it's not necessarily limited to you know, very specific focused environments, that it can be used across many, many environments, many geologic settings as well. Um, so we hope that's a takeaway. Slide 61, some of the reasons why we think the there's any, such an increase in use. I already touched on this, but this, this example here I think will illustrate something that's really important. Um, that you know, recent experience shows that source zones are often distributed, as shown in this figure, with very, you know, very steep concentration gradients over short distances. And our typical characterization techniques may not capture this, or at least the ones we've we've used in the past. Tamsin showed an earlier slide how we take uh, uh, how we get to a resolution, how we translate this into say those square boxes that. Um, you know, that's basically what we're trying to do. So the, the, the tighter the spacing, the, the more we can capture this kind of um, these steep gradients and these, these uh, high source zones with transects or whatever, the, the better our mass flux and mass discharge measurements are going to be, the more accurate they're going to be. So um, we also have, uh, you know, an advent of relatively inexpensive direct push techniques that have been around for many years now that can provide this kind of higher resolution detail uh, to capture the details of what this distribution looks like. And we think that um, this is really driving, I think, now, now with higher resolutions, people are more interested in, in mass flux and mass discharge and, and vice versa. So you have to, if you're going to do it, you, do, you probably would be wise to get a high, you know, higher degree of resolution than maybe has been done uh, in the past. Another reason is the availability of better models and databases. And Chuck talked a little bit about that the Mass Flux Toolkit, and other ones such as Remclor and Biochlor that he, he mentioned. So there's, there's more better tools than ever before, and uh, it's all kind of coming together, I think, to drive this, drive the increase in, in interest in Mass Flux and Mass Discharge. So let me move on to slide 62. This chart shows the range of Mass Discharge estimate, or the magnitude of the estimates based on our case study review. 
Um, this is from 44 of the sites where actual mass discharge um, was uh, the value was estimated. The key point is to give you some context of what you might measure at your site and what it means. We're very used to understanding what concentrations mean. We have screening levels and remedial action goals, uh, remedial goals for you know based on concentration, but we really don't have that for mass discharge estimates. So this is meant to just give you a put you in the ballpark. What are we kind of looking at uh, in, in, that's out there? What are people measuring? Um, the, the upshot here is that this range, <laughs> these estimates range over eight orders of magnitude, from about a low of about one gram per, per year to nearly a, you know, 1,000 kilograms per year. That's quite a range for mass discharge estimates. Um, as Tamsin mentioned uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and Chuck mentioned, He's proposed uh, a plume classification concept. I think that was in a December 2011 groundwater uh, journal article. The idea is to provide a context based on threat potential for a plume within a, with a given mass discharge. So we want to try to relate the magnitude here to some sort of threat potential. Um, so take a look at that article if you want to kind of get into that, that headspace of where, what, what, these, uh, what to do with these, these kind of magnitudes and numbers. On slide 63, kind of more of the same, um, more discharge measurements. These were compiled by Einerson and McKay. Again, there's a wide range from a few hundred grams per year to a few hundred kilograms per year here. Uh, it also shows that mass discharge isn't just for chlorinated solvents, um, because you can see there's four MTBE sites where it was used um, and estimated. Uh, at my agency, we found over a dozen sites where groundwater extraction systems have yielded good mass discharge estimates. Uh, and that's for the portion of the source or plume that that groundwater extraction system is designed to capture. Uh, we're in the process of compiling those data and, and comparing the estimates to, say, area-weighted or volume-weighted average concentrations over, over the source or plume to, to see if there, what, what sort of, how we might be able to correlate the two, roughly speaking, assuming uh, the gradient may, and, and is uniform and, and maybe conductivity is uniform. But that's, uh, that's dependent on site heterogeneity. Um, on slide 64, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to give you an example of, of how you might actually estimate that sort of threat potential from a, um, um, a plume with a given mass discharge. So this, is, um, th this slide shows one way. It was put together, again, developed by Einerson and McKay for estimating potential impacts to a well. Now, that well might be an extraction well. It might be a supply well. It could be, it could be you might want to think of it even as a surface water body, that, you know, something that is capturing this, um, you know, this plume. In this example, you've got a source area that is generating a mass discharge of 2 grams per day, this source area here, generating a mass discharge of 2 grams per day. And the extraction well that we're using, uh, we're assuming it's a, uh, it's pumping at 600 gallons per minute, and it's we're assuming it's fully capturing the plume and then and then some some clean water as well. The question is, how much of a threat is this plume really? A two gram per day mass discharge plume tends to be at the low end of that scale that I showed you, but you know you still don't really know what, 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 how bad is this. So could it cause the extracted groundwater to exceed some standard or discharge limit? Let's say this was a a well a supply well or a surface water body, and there were some regulatory limits on that. So the equation down here is uh, you know, a good way to, to do that. Assuming the extraction well is pumping at 600 gallons a minute, completely captures that plume uh, that's contributing 2 grams per day. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you, if you run the math, you end up with um, the C sub well term that's up here in this equation, basically is what you're, you're, you're looking for. And, it would work out to be um, 0 0.6 micrograms per liter, or less than, less than 1 microgram per liter, less than 1 ppb. Now, this could then be compared to an applicable standard or a discharge limit to at least give you a sense of whether this plume, assuming you have an, a fairly accurate handle on it, it's been well characterized, and this discharge, mass discharge estimate is, is in the ballpark, it'll give you some sense of what the threat potential 
to that extraction well, supply well, or surface water body is. Um, so I think it's a really powerful thing to help you get in the ballpark. The kind, this kind, you know, I'll just say this kind of analysis it can form the basis of an assessment of threat posed by that plume. At the same time, you know, I am a regulator, so I do have to offer a word of caution, and that is that, you know, due to the uncertainty, we've talked a lot about that. There is some uncertainty in these measurements. Um, this sort of analysis would almost certainly require, you know, an extra factor of safety to to be built in, and I'm sure regulators are going to insist on that. Uh, particularly if the receptor was a supply well or surface water body, where um, where where most regulators don't want to see any discharge. Uh, furthermore, you know uh, we probably would require some kind of abatement, even if it you know even if the numbers came out came out uh, below the discharge limit, the acceptable limit. Again, due to that due to that sense of uncertainty. Um, so, but uh, this type of evaluation is really aimed at understanding that threat potential and helping us understand and compare, use concentration and mass discharge in complementary ways. Um, you've seen this figure before, uh, except I've, it's been modified a little bit. Tamsin showed this one earlier. Um, so in this figure, the concentration was uniform. It, it, we've assumed it's a uniform concentration. Uh, earlier, it was uh, in Tamsin's example, it was uniform. Here we've changed it up a little bit. So we assume the concentration in the fine sand is 5,000 micrograms per liter. Maybe you've, you've measured the pour water there or a short well screen in that, in that fine sand, and that's what you're getting. And the gravelly sand has a much lower concentration, um, and maybe that's because it's the more highly, it is the high, more highly transmissive zone. And, uh, and remediation has done a good job of, of cleaning that out. Um, and then the sand, somewhere in between 500 micrograms per liter. Uh, the gradient is still uniform in all of these, 0 0.003. And, uh, and then the, uh, the hydraulic conductivity is different in all of these. Again, the most conductive, conduct, conductive or transmissive is the gravelly sand, with the sand a little bit lower than that, and then the, the fine sand even lower, the, the least permeable zone. Um, you, do the, you run the math in the calculations, and what you find here is that 55% of the mass flux um, is actually moving through the fine sand. And that's a little bit different. Earlier, Tamsin's example was 85% in the gravelly sand, and with smaller amounts in the fine and, and in the sand. But here, you can imagine a slightly different scenario. We see this quite often as well. Now, this example probably mimics what we might call an older release scenario. The Dean apple is largely depleted, and most of the residual mass may have diffused into the low permeability zone. And now it's being, being controlled by back diffusion, back into the more transmissive zone. So as greater flows here, there's a diffusion gradient, which is a chemical gradient, not advection. And, uh, and, and now the fine sand is essentially the, uh, where most of the mass flux is occurring. So knowing this can help you really lead, you know, lead to selecting an optimal technology for your maximum effect. Now, you know, just imagine if you didn't know this. You'd probably end up focusing on the gravelly sand, doing lots of remediation, and, uh, and then every time you turn the system off, concentrations rebound and leave you scratching your head, not knowing where to turn next. That's, a, that's been you know, the history of pump and treat systems since uh, the late 80s. So this is really important to understand this, and we think with the higher resolution techniques and mass discharge estimates, mass flux estimates, you can really nail this down. All right. Slide 66. I just now I'm going to summarize again, um, nearing the end here. I got a couple more slides to talk about regulatory acceptance, but uh, just to summarize, these are those six categories that we identified for use in, uh, for application of mass flux and mass discharge based on a case study. Category one is site characterization, uh, which is about getting your baseline strength and understanding the um, perhaps perhaps measuring and monitoring or estimating the rate of natural attenuation. Category two is about using mass discharge to evaluate the threats, as I talked about in the example, say to a supply well or to a uh, surface water body, if a plume may be discharging or threatening to discharge to those things. Categories three and four are about using mass discharge to develop more effective remedies, targeting those high 
uh, concentration gradient source zone areas, figuring out where they are, and then targeting them, measuring them, figuring out how much they're really contributing to the overall problem. Category five is this compliance monitoring one, which I haven't said much about uh, much about yet. Um, I will in a moment. And then Tamsin is also going to discuss a case study where the US EPA actually did adopt uh, the use of mass flux, mass discharge as a regulatory metric. And lastly, category six is this site pr has those two components. If you're a consultant or a practitioner, it can help you uh, prioritize among sources or figure out whose source might it might you know, who done it, who, whose source might be the the one contributing um, to the plume, um, and and maybe ruling out others. If you're a regulator like me, you've got 20 sites you're dealing with. And you're sort of like, well, how, which one needs the regulatory order? or a higher degree of regulatory attention because it's more of a threat. So that's what Category 6 is about. All right, regulatory precedents. So in, in the, the last two slides, I'm going to just talk about precedents and acceptance from a regulatory point of view. Now, I do believe that there's ample precedent for the use of mass discharge in a regulatory context, yet for various reasons, um, it still remains somewhat unfamiliar, although we've been doing this webinar now for well, I guess this is um, our sixth or seventh year. So uh, uh, you know, I hear it talked about more and more in the hallways. I hear it talked about more and more at conferences. So I think the word is, has certainly gotten out a lot more than it, it had when we started. Um, first, there are examples where regulatory agencies have accepted the use of mass discharge. One is the, the, the site. It's called the 12A, uh, Well 12A Superfund site. Tamsin is going to talk about that. That's in the state of Washington. And the EPA has accepted the use of a mass discharge in a record of decision from 2009. So it's, it's a really good one of the early examples. Um, and in that case, as in other cases that we're seeing now, it's being used as a trigger to say when active remediation of a particular area, maybe a source area, or a plume can, can transition uh, to monitored natural attenuation. Um, you know, knocking it down, measuring it, looking at the mass discharge reduction that occurs, and then setting you know some some metric on that amount of reduction needed to to trigger the change. Um, second, uh, for precedence, as you know was mentioned earlier, uh, regulatory programs for surface water dischargers, such as our total maximum daily loads and our uh, NPDES or NIPDES permits, whatever you prefer, they, they've always relied on mass discharge to a surface water body to really determine what the appropriate effluent limit is. You know, imagine uh, point sources going into surface water bodies. Agencies have to uh, allocate um, you know, an acceptable amount of mass that can come from that source, and that gets written into permits. That whole calculation is done on uh, is essentially a mass discharge mixing zone um, type type calculation. So regulators in surface water programs are quite familiar with this concept, but uh, for cleanup, I think it's uh, it's a little different. We've been focused on constant point concentrations and, and watching them reduce as the metric, and maybe been missing part of the uh, you know uh, part of the the concept here that we could could help us do a better job. And then third is um, um, as Tamsin talked about, or, or Chuck talked about, I'm sorry, groundwater extraction systems. We have lots of these in place. We have for many, many years. Uh, if they're capturing uh, the, a plume or even a portion of the plume, and uh, you know you measure that that effluent contaminant concentration, and you multiply by the extraction rate, well, basically you have an estimate of mass discharge for whatever part of that plume is being captured. Now, assuming that you're not pumping so hard as to as to induce more or a lot more mass discharge than what might be happening under happening under say a natural gradient. Um, then then that extraction system is is giving you a pretty good estimate. And a lot of extraction systems you know are in in low permeability areas, and so they're pumping at low rates. So you can assume that they're not really uh, inducing a lot of extra mass discharge. So they might actually be, be very good estimates of, of the mass discharge that's happening under a natural gradient scenario. And then fourth, um, I just want to reiterate that the rate of natural attenuation is essentially a mass discharge exercise. That's because the difference in mass discharge between two locations across a plume is a direct estimate of natural attenuation with that one caveat I made about um, uh, uh, mass move, moving in and out of storage. 
But because we live in a concentration-based world, we've pretty much all been taught to focus on indirect indicators such, uh, for, for natural attenuation, such as con concentration changes over time and over distance, and then you know, biogeochemical parameters. But you know, mass discharge transects across a bloom are going to give you the most direct measurement of that. And then my last slide, regulatory acceptance. So in developing the document and the training, we had many discussions about what the regulatory barriers are to the use of mass flux and mass discharge and how to overcome them. And it kind of boils down to some very basic needs. So first, you know, we've got to develop a comfort letter, familiarity with these concepts. And that's, that's the purpose of our guidance and our training, to increase the familiarity out there. And then second, we have to have a, there has to be a need to understand how mass discharge can relate to risk, or there is a need, but we have to understand how, how it can it relate to risk uh, and risk-based concentration standards, which are the traditional regulatory metrics for compliance. So I want to stress that we're advocating the use of mass flux and mass discharge in conjunction with concentrations, not as a replacement. So just as concentration is a good estimate of the risk, um, mass discharge is a good estimate of the threat. And that's, you know, that's really important when you're talking about supply wells or surface water body receptors. You know, while concentration may vary greatly over time and space, the mass discharge aims to capture the overall effects of that variability, sort of an integration, if you will. And, uh, and that can help refine the exposure assessment. And then third and finally, you know, there, there is, is the need to envision a future compliance role for mass discharge. And that's starting to move and happen more and more and more. Um, if I had to bet, I'd say that assessing threats to receptors and developing triggers for remedy transition, you know, that's going to be the growth area for mass discharge. I also think that basing cleanup success on individual well concentrations alone is really an incomplete picture. And, you know, and at worst, um, it incentivizes what I call this sort of whack-a-mole approach where you're just out there to clean up a well and show the regulators that, gee, the concentration in this well has gone down. But that's really not looking at the source plume continuum sort of holistically. So I think mass discharge can really help. Now with that, I'm going to I'm finished with my section. I'm going to turn this back over to Tamsin Macbeth uh, with CDM Smith for some case studies. Thanks, Alec. OK, so that was a really good overview of using mass flux, kind of the history of it, and the perception of how we can use it within the regulatory community and acceptance and so forth. One of the key things that really helps understand how these metrics are used is to show examples of how they've been used successfully um, and you know, talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly um, in case studies. So first we're going to talk about the frequency of the applications. And this just sort of uh, goes through what we've talked about already, which is this survey that we did early on to really look at where these metrics were being applied at sites and which of the different methods was being used. And in this early survey, again, we showed that the vast majority of people were using transects. I can say that one of the things that I would say has really progressed, and certainly in the compliance avenue, is doing pumping tests. This integral pumping test is one type of test. But we've been using these mass discharge metrics a lot uh, with our pump and treat sites to evaluate contaminant mass discharge and to use that as a basis for um, doing some additional source treatment or additional actions to reduce the discharge coming into the pump and treat system sufficiently that that system can be turned off. And I'm going to talk about a site where we're doing that. So I would say, the percentage or the amount that's being used in pumping tests has probably increased. The passive flux meters have been, I would say, that technology has been increasing a lot in usage. That technology can be really useful in fractured rock sites. Um, we've been using that a lot to really help us quantify Darcy flux for groundwater within secondary fracture zones, which can be a difficult thing to estimate. 
Um, so I would say that's going up a lot, and we're using that a lot in fractured rock sites. And then the modeling, I would say, is probably on a percentage level very consistent with the numbers that you see here. So let's talk about one of the first examples that was published in the literature, this Einerson and McKay paper that we talked about a little bit before, um, where mass flux and mass discharge was really published using this very high resolution transect here where they had these piezometers and they were evaluating, in this case it was CIS-12 DCE, so you can see where all the sampling ports were in here. So one of the first kind of elements that's come out of this paper that has really proven true as we have continued to implement these metrics at other sites is that when you evaluate the distribution of mass, about 80% of the mass across or within this plume transect is present in about 7% of the transect area, meaning that rather than having these very you know, nice uniform contaminant plumes, these plumes are really very often characterized by these very concentrated hot spot, almost like stream tubes. Um, of high concentrations that really represent a very small percentage of the overall transect where you might have uh, con contaminant concentrations. The other key thing that's really boded well in terms of being able to reproduce this kind of statistic at other sites is that 90% of the mass occurs where concentrations are greater than 20,000 uh, micrograms per liter, meaning, you know, it, these very high concentration stream tubes where you have a lot of mass, you know, really are very often what are driving advective transport of your contaminant plume. So identifying these hot spots, really refining in in these areas can have a lot of advantages, certainly from a remedial design standpoint. I do a lot of in situ treatment design with bio and chemical oxidation and even thermal. And with bio and chemox in particular, being able to hone in those injection screen intervals to really focus on these areas of concentrated mass and concentrated discharge can provide a lot of savings on the back end for implementing those remedies. So the second example that we're going to show is probably the first, well, it's the first known example of using mass discharge as a compliance goal. And in this case, it's the Well 12A Superfund site in Tacoma, Washington. This is actually uh, a project that I w have worked on for a number of years. And it was a site that's been on the national priorities list since 1982. It was an industrial facility where they discharged different types of oily wastes and sludges and had uh, storage tanks and manufacturing facilities that resulted in a lot of denapple releases into the subsurface. And it generated a very large dissolved phase contaminant plume where TCE in 1982 was discovered to be impacting this well 12A municipal supply well. So they tracked that contamination back, identified this source to this um, industrial property, implemented a whole slew of remedial actions over the course of about 25 years that included an on-site source area pump and treat system, um, treatment of the water that was being extracted at the municipal discharge well, um, extraction well, uh, soil vapor extraction and excavation, and they, and they remediated for a number of years and still realized that they weren't going to achieve restoration of this groundwater plume, and the city of Tacoma was pressuring EPA to clean this plume up so that they could have unrestricted use of this supply well. So EPA initiated a focused feasibility study, and they really looked at the attenuation capacity of the contaminant plume, and they determined that if they could initiate some additional source reduction measures um, and reduce the source strength and the discharge of contaminants migrating off that source by 90%, that that plume could attenuate the, the contaminants that were discharged to groundwater treat drinking standards before they reached this municipal supply well. So based on that, a record of decision and amendment was issued 
to do a multi-component remedy that included in-situ thermal and in-situ bio in addition to the on-site pump and treat to achieve that mass discharge reduction. We actually just wrapped that up, achieve that uh, reduction, and now we're actually going into long-term monitoring for this site. Um, we found this method, and in particular, the compliance metric in this case example that we used was a pumping test. We had this great pump and treat system that had been designed to capture the plume coming off the source zone, so we actually used that pump and treat system in the and that mass discharge coming into the pump and treat system to determine that we had met that 90% reduction in discharge before remedial actions compared to after we implemented those remedial actions. And so that worked, it, was, it worked very, very well. Um, the next case example is really this uh, way that you can prioritize sites. Um, this is an example where there's multiple sources that had been identified for this contaminant plume. This is based on a Bauer et al. paper, this 2004 paper. So there was a, a variety of different sources that were known that were contributing to contamination to this very large dissolved phase plume that, again, was impacting these receptor wells, these pumping wells. And so they wanted to look at how or which of the sources were really contributing the majority of the discharge coming into that contaminant plume. So they implemented a characterization where they uh, installed some transects here down gradient of these three known sources and evaluated the contaminant mass discharge. And so as you can see here, this was a very large source area, but it was very old. And when they looked at the total discharge coming into this system, it was about uh, 1.6 kilograms uh, per year of contaminant mass discharging from this source compared to this smaller source, but it had about five kilograms per year of contaminant mass that was discharging from this source compared to this source, which was, you know, a, a, in a, a smaller source, and it was contributing about 2.4 kilograms per year. So after doing this evaluation, they realized that this source was contributing the most mass. So by understanding that, you can focus remedial actions and prioritize treatment uh, on the sources that are really contributing the majority of the discharge to this plume. And so for large sites, industrial sites, complex sites where you've got multiple sources, this can be a really good tool to help you in your programmatic evaluation make decisions about where you should allocate remediation dollars. So this is the uh, case study that Alex talked about all the way back at the beginning of this training. This is the Reese Air Force Base case study. And this is an interesting case study because it's, it's one where just some adjustments in operating the existing remedy but reevaluating it using mass flux and mass discharge really helped to one, understand the site, and two, really optimize the remedy to affect much more efficient treatment. So this is a site, it's a very, it's a chlorinated solvent site, very concentrated plume and source area. This is the delineation of the plume um, in 2004, and there was a very large pump and treat system that had multiple pumping wells all throughout this plume that had been operating for a number of years. Again, this is three miles, so it's a very long, significant plume. And it was, when you look at sort of the distribution of concentrations and mass, the plume hadn't changed a whole lot over the course of those pumping operations. So uh, the contractor, Arcadis, took a look at that treatment system and one, they really refined what the wells and how the data were being interpolated and interpreted. And what they realized is that some of these outlying locations out here were really kind of misinforming the plume architecture. And they realized when they went back and looked at the geology and all the boring logs, 
that there was a very significant preferential fan channel that really was conveying the plume. And that sand channel, that high conductivity, this is a very kind of uniform sandy aquifer, but that very conductive sand channel was really where the majority of the plume was occurring. So what was happening is they were extracting, you know, pumping wells that were sort of to the sides of that channel. And that was actually resulting in the plume getting drawn out of the channel and towards those extraction wells. So they stopped extracting on those peripheral wells, and they increased pumping and capture of the extraction wells that were actually within that sand channel. And just in two years, just making that operational change, you can see what a reduction and what an effect that had on the extent of that contaminant plume. And then in another two years, you can see how that change in operations of that pump and treat system really dramatically increased the efficiency of that treatment system and the ability of that system to reduce that contaminant plume, remove mass, and retract the plume. So again, this is not a change in remedy or doing anything different. It's just looking at the site in a different way and making better, more informed decisions, understanding where the contaminant mass was and where the contaminant mass flux was really occurring and how to manipulate that to operate the system more efficiently. So that was all a really big deal. Um, and so anyway, that wraps up our case studies. Um, it's now my pleasure to uh, turn the presentation back over to Alex McDonald with the California Water Board. Thank you, Camden. Um, everyone should be looking at slide 75. And I'm going to use the next couple slides after this to uh, basically summarize some of the key points that Tams and Chuck and Alec presented in their, in their excellent presentations you just heard. I think you guys should <clears throat> feel fortunate to have, <clears throat> have listened to them present that information. So let's on, get on to the end of this, and let's move to slide 76. Um, <clears throat> as, we're, as, as you got through those presentations, estimating mass flux provides useful input into site remediation and evaluation efforts. Um, by gathering that, that, that necessary information and using that information to estimate mass flux and mass discharge, you de you've developed an improved site conceptual model. That's one of the keys to remediating your site, knowing where everything is, having a good idea <clears throat> on where the contamination is and where it is flowing. Um, and this effort will also provide a more informed selection of the appropriate remedial technology and where to place that re remedy so you make sure you're increasing the chances of that of success for that treatment system by knowing exactly where to be placing it. So that one of the also things, that third bullet under estimating mass flux, you're refining the exposure assessment. If you know where it's flowing, you can, you can tell where the exposure is going to occur. And so by doing that, you'll know where the receptor, who the, where the receptors are, what wells are potentially going to be impacted, the potential effect on those wells, so you can take the appropriate remedial actions to protect those receptors. Um, this all leads into more effective site management. If you, the, the more you know, the better you know it, the more effective you're going to be in remediating that site and making sure that you're doing your job in protecting the uh, potential receptors to that contamination. And as Chuck was saying, you can you don't need to, not necessarily need to go out and to collect a lot of spend a lot of money collecting a lot more information. In many cases, you can use historical data and existing monitoring networks to, to provide those cross sections and those flux, to get those, that, that data to do your flux measurements and, and figure out where the mass is flowing. And then lastly, you, as Alec was talking about, you can enhance compliance measurements. Not only if we know where the mass is flowing, the high concentrations are flowing, we can actually put in, in place putting in the proper monitoring points to actually measure compliance and potentially even using mass flux as one of those compliance metrics that we'll be using. Move to slide 77. If you remember back near the beginning, I presented this slide with the same same four questions on the right, on the left, and the figure on the on the on the right. Um, and we went over these in our presentation fairly significantly. You remember um, Camson brought to you what is mass, what is mass flux, and how how what type of measurements do you need to take to be able to calculate those mass fluxes? 
So you see, why should I estimate mass flux and discharge? You're going to give a better characterization, more a better exposure assessment, better placement of your remedy. Even then, you can even optimize the site to collect that mass in a, in a more efficient manner. Um, you can even, as Alex talked about, do site prioritization. One of the the, the examples that Al, uh, that Tanzan gave at the end was showing where which one of those sites would you spend the uh, take your action first and spend the most money to start with to remove that mass and stop that uh, to spread that contamination in a more efficient manner and also in compliance. So these are the whys we should be estimating mass flux. How to? Well, the how to Chuck gave you five different methods to do it. Those five different methods based on personality potential. That actually gave a pretty good job of you know, all the different ways you can go about calculating this mass flux. And you might want to even do more than one way. You might do two or three ways to get a, a range of different mass fluxes that you can, can then compare to each other. <clears throat> Cost benefits of using mass flux discharge. Obviously, by place, being able to place your remedy more efficiently to begin with, you're going to reduce the l length of time to clean up, which then your life cycle costs are going to go down. Targeting the remediation to the place where it will do the best for the least amount of money. And can mass flux help measure compliance? It can measure two different things. Remember, as Alex was talking about, you can actually measure concentration data and also mass flux data. C using both will actually give you a better um, measure on how successful you are in cleaning up the site. The concentrations gives you, gives you exposure issues. The mass flux will give you what the threat is. So using both those metrics, you actually do a better job of, of measuring the risk at your site. Move to slide 78. And here we have the follow-on to what you've learned today. There's the, 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 uh, our Dean Apple Site Strategy Team has come up with three additional documents since the um, putting out the mass flux document. The first was the integrated Dean Apple Site Strategy document. Um, Make sure you go to the ITRC website to to get to download that. I recommend that for any site um, project manager. It provides substantial information and the ins and outs on how to set up a, a successful conceptual excuse me conceptual site model. How to do that even if you don't have Dean Apple. Make sure you go and grab that. Following that, we needed to we actually came up with a document on site characterization of Dean Apple uh, sites with Dean Apple. Once again. Don't let that Dean Apple uh, title scare you, even if you don't have Dean Apple. Something very useful in that uh, that document is a tools table, which would, by if even if you that's all you used, you're going to be far ahead in the game in, in, in remediating and investigating and remediating your site if, if you just you know, use that uh, tools table. And the last document, which uh, Tamson mentioned, was coming out uh, hopefully by the end of this year, with uh, training starting from ITRC early next year is characterization and remediation of fractured rock. You know, as we said, we determined that fractured rock has, was its own unique beast and needed to be uh, uh, dealt with specifically. So that, that's coming out soon, and I think that will be an online document where, where you just uh, get to point, pick, and choose, and pull down menus, and be able to link to other documents. Very efficient. So I think you'll enjoy that one. And that's all I have for this uh, presentation. So I'll turn over to, to Julianne Cheatham for the last um, question and answer period. Thanks, Alex. And um, Alex just mentioned that Fractured Rock document. If you want to be one of the first to know when that's available, you can follow ITRC. And then that's at the top of the slide. Um, it's available uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever your social media method is. Uh, we do use social media, so it's a great way to keep up with what ITRC is doing by following social media. We uh, welcome additional questions, so everyone's welcome to send in a question using the Q&A pod in the lower right. If you're on the phone line, jump in with a question, pound six to unmute. We also have a final poll couple of questions for you. Would you recommend using the mass flux and mass discharge measurement methods described today? And you can say yes, no, and unsure if you need to learn more. And then also, thinking about projects that you're working on, in the next six months, how could you use this ITRC document? And we do have those both set so that you can share the results uh, with others in the audience today. 
Again, we have our links to additional resources, and we've talked about some of those throughout today's training class. This is a great page for you to go learn more. Not everything in today's presentation was linked, but we do have this links page available for you to go and follow some of the links to some of the other resources that we've talked about today. And the feedback form is very important. We do look for everyone on the call today to fill out the feedback. If you have more than one person at your location, one person can fill it out, and then there's a link to go back so additional people at your location can fill out the feedback form if they're interested in doing that. And the feedback form is also how you get a certificate for attending today's training. So be sure to check that box at the bottom to certify you attended. Once you submit, the system's going to create that certificate for you. And right now, that's the only way to get the certificate. So if you forget to check the box, just go back, check the box, submit again, and that's going to allow you to get a certificate for attending today. And that certificate is both going to be available on that confirmation page after you submit the feedback in the upper right. You'll see the view your certificate of participation. That's a PDF. So it'll be your name and the name of today's class. Also, if you provided an email address, it'll be emailed to you as well. So we've had some questions that have uh, come in uh, after the first question and answer break. And I know trainers have answered some of these online, but I think a couple are worth sharing with the entire audience. One person said that uh, he thinks it would be better to use methods four and five to develop an initial perspective. Any comments? This is Tamsin. Yeah, so that I would definitely agree with, especially if you already have a model and a, you know, especially 3D model or, or maybe a numerical model or, or analytical model that you've developed for the site and you just want to use those tools that you've already developed to really go back and look at things from a mass discharge perspective, um, that can be really helpful. We also very often, I had a site that we recently worked on and are working on um, that's a fractured rock site where we were really looking at contaminant flow and fate and transport in secondary fracture zones and trying to follow bedding planes. And we were able to use some analytical modeling tools to do two things. One, to calculate the effect or estimate the, the effect of diffusional flux. It was in the New Jersey, New Brunswick shale formation. So we were concerned about uh, diffusion as a potential long-term source of contamination. Um, so we did some cray flesh modeling and some kind of 2D plate modeling to evaluate that matrix diffusion effect and quantify whether it was significant, how significant it was both in the source and the plume. And then we just used some simple analytical bait and transport models, uh, did some biocore type calculations to look at bait and transport of chemicals in the fracture zones um, at that fractured rock site. So, Using those analytical tools, you know, was really helpful for us to build the conceptual site model to really understand these different compartments and where our mass was and the fate and transport. And we did that as a basis for deciding if and, and how much active remediation we were going to do at that particular site and estimate what that might buy us in terms of, you know, achieving remedial action objectives. So. You know, I guess the long and the short is, you know, we didn't intend to um, not or to make it seem like those methods were not as desirable or not preferable. They definitely are. They, they can be very powerful. Um, a lot of it is just we don't really have time to fully vet and, and develop, you know, all of the different modeling tools that are out there that allow you to do these calculations. But they are significant and, and very helpful. Um, another, I'll just plug um, CERTIP and ESTCP, which is the Department of Defense's uh, Research and Development Program, um, has funded an uh, update to Ron Fault at Clemson's REMCOR model, which uh, evaluates Fate and transport uses some analytical solutions, uh, and specifically it's geared towards allowing you to implement some remedial actions and do some predictive evaluations about how those actions will result in 
concentration and flux reductions over time from the source area or from the plume, and that can be really helpful in kind of the planning process and just kind of conceptualizing what the remedy might look like through a life cycle analysis as you're, you know, building a remedy. So those tools can, I would agree with the comment, are very helpful, especially on the upfront sort of strategic planning of remedies. When evaluating mass flux, I would think it would be important to also look at possible matrix diffusion, especially if the plume is old. What do you think? Oh, well, um, well, this is Go ahead, Go ahead Tamsin. Mm -hmm. oh. I was just going to say, well, I just got done talking about uh, how useful uh, it is to evaluate <laughs> matrix diffusion. Um, if you have a sedimentary rock um, or if you have you know, very stratified, you know, heterogeneous plume in unconsolidated media where you have a lot of, you know, intercalated silts and sands and clay layers, then you're definitely going to want to account for matrix diffusion in your conceptual site model. So I'll turn it over to Chuck. Okay, and, and I think I'm just going to echo some of the things you said, Tamsin, on this one in your previous uh, answer. Uh, but yeah, it was the uh, matrix fusion was certainly in our minds as, as we were developing some of this. And I think slide number, you know, 23 has got that type of thing where you can do those transects and see that mass flux and get an idea of where that stuff's coming from. And if there's no indication there's a, a napple there, but but it is coming from these clay units, you can sort of get the idea. Oh, maybe most of my source term is not uh, a D napple, but maybe it's this matrix matrix diffusion component. So definitely something that um, you know, is integral to this whole idea of mass flux, mass discharge, particularly with this transect method where you do high resolution sampling, you can, you know, get that whole transect and see what where stuff is uh, where stuff's originating from. So, so definitely true there. Just another quick note is uh, we're actually um, working with um, Ron Falter right now to update Remclor and do this ma matrix diffusion version of it that I think will be real useful for people and. Um, um, we're working on the interface right now with with, uh, with Dr. Falta. I hope to get something out um, maybe a, a, a early, mid next year. But it will have things where people will describe their heterogeneity they have at the site, and then you can run this Remcore model and it integrates the flow and the concentration and tells you even if you only have a matrix diffusion type source that's left, um, how that impacts you, what your mass discharge would be from that. Good, good comment. Is there a way to transform MIP CPT data so that you can calculate mass flux? Uh, this is Chuck. I'll take a dive at it. And, and we actually did a CERTA project where it, the question was very similar. And it was, can you use this MIP data to go in there and is a replacement for this high resolution sampling to understand matrix diffusion? And the paper came out and says, well, it sort of gets you there, but it's certainly not an exact match. And we looked at ways to improve the MIP, which is changing gas flow rates, doing up logging and down logging, and maybe that can help um, you know, a little bit. But still, uh, we, we said it's still um, not the super quantitative method um, to do that. There have been some advances with the MIP. There's now this low detector MIP, which I think can, can help you uh, um, understand mass flux a little bit better, because sometimes those concentrations are lower. Um, but I don't think it's still not a way that you can sort of do this MIP calculation or do this MIP and, um, project at your site and get sort of milligram per kilogram per uh, uh, type numbers in, 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 in soil. But uh, other folks, um, any other opinions about, about MIP? Yeah, this is Tamsin. We've tried to do that at a number of sites. Um, the, and I think as Chuck said, Really, I just reiterate the the ability to do that relies on the ability to correlate the concentrations that you measure in confirmation samples with the re MIP response, and we never have been able to get very good correlations. So the MIP tends to be good at you know, telling you where your hot spots are and kind of allowing you to evaluate the relative or step changes in concentrations over, you know, significant scales. 
but it really doesn't do a very good job allowing you to actually quantify what the concentrations are and thus what the mass discharge is. So we really just use it as a screening tool to help inform where we collect quantitative samples like soil and groundwater samples so we can actually do the mass flux and mass discharge calculations. Um, we use MIP a lot to help us say lay in a transect and ensure that that transect is across the plume and to help us select screen intervals for transect wells. We've, used, we've done that a lot, but, but not directly using the MIP data. Thanks. I want to share another question that the trainers have answered online, but uh, this came in around slide 64 when Alec was talking. And the question is, what would be that extra factor of safety to account for the mentioned uncertainty? And this is Chuck, and I tried to answer that, I think, on the uh, um, just sort of, you know, I'll talk, trying to type some stuff in there. But I, I mentioned that during our discussions, we, we talked about what is the accuracy or what's the, the precision of some of these mass flux, mass discharge measurements. And, and we sort of said this isn't a plus or minus 10 percent or 20 percent thing. This is, this is more like hydraulic conductivity, getting data from slug tests. We sort of got a sense that there's more variability in there is not one of these super precise things. And so maybe the, the uncertainty we have in some of our mass flux calculations, either either going, you know, down gradient or, or doing a calculation up gradient with the, with the well um, sort of calculation, maybe it's closer to an order of magnitude. Um, but that all depends on sort of how much data you've got. And is it, if you have 10 monitoring points in your transect or do you have, do you have 100? And, um, and then what, what's your confidence in your estimate for the Darcy velocity and things like that? Just another observation is this, this plume classification um, paper we wrote, we sort of had this concept it's that if you want to have a plume magnitude classification system, it should be like the Richter scale where these, these, each category goes up by a factor of 10 because there was 10 orders of magnitude between the smallest site, which we call in Texas a pissant site, and maybe some of the largest sites, which are, you know, mega sites. And so um, it's, it, it's, it's not a plus or minus 10 percent thing, maybe closer to order of magnitude. And maybe that would translate when you start thinking about factors of safety. Um, yeah. This, but this is off the top of my head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chuck, yeah, this is Alec. I'll, I'll, I agree. That was a great answer. And uh, um, orders of, an order of magnitude probably is a minimum sort of factor of safety to consider on this, it, it, but depending on the, the, the method that was used to calculate it, the inherent uncertainty in that method. I, I will also say that um, since this is kind of under the header of threat assessment, getting into the ballpark then allows a conversation with, with agencies such as mine about time frames for the next steps. So if you've shown that you're, you know, you've got more than an order of magnitude factor of safety, that's probably going to buy you some time to consider next steps because we're still always concerned about any discharge to a receptor, not just one that is at or below a, uh, a risk-based number. Um, as long as there are feasible, you know, steps that can be taken you know, that are feasible technically or economically to, to limit that discharge, that conversation would continue. But the question then is how, how urgent does it need to be moved forward? And uh, you know, so, so having a measurement with a factor of safety can perhaps reduce the urgency, but it's not going to eliminate the need for that conversation. Has anyone used HPT data in K for these mass flux calculations? This is Tamsin. We've actually done that on a number of projects um, where we have uh, used HPT. The one thing about doing that that you have to make some decisions about really is how you want to handle the high resolution profiles that you get with HPT because it gives you often, you know, these profiles of conductivity on a centimeter scale. And so when you're looking at translating that into estimating kind of a bulk mass flux or mass discharge, you often have to evaluate or integrate those data over say, the screen length of your monitoring wells where you're pulling the concentration data. Um, so we've done it a number of ways. We've both included 
the HPT high resolution data in something like a 3D model, um, MBS, and then calculated, you know, using a very small grid, the fluxes um, of uh, coming off of the, using that high resolution profile. And then we've also averaged the hydraulic conductivity data over, say, you know, a four or five foot interval um, to give us more of a bulk average hydraulic conductivity um, across a, a groundwater well screen, if, you know, when you go back in and install groundwater well. Yeah, this is Chuck. I think you, there, you have to be a little careful, um, or you have, maybe you have to do some additional work. I know the Waterloo Profiler, I think, gives you an index of hydraulic conductivity and not just that actual number. And so I think what some people have done is take that index of hydraulic conductivity, which gives you this relative value, but then they tie it into, you know, something that's more definitive, like a slug test over here or something else. You've got to anchor it into some other things. So um, um, I think I've seen, heard some talks where people have done something like that to try to get that really marvelous high-resolution flow data uh, or, or index of hydraulic conductivity data translated to get centimeters per second. That goes into Darcy's law, and then you have a, a different um, Darcy flow rate for each window pane. Pretty, pretty neat stuff. Yeah, in the case of HPT, they actually you um, you do dissipation tests in every borehole, and that allows them. They basically derived an empirical relationship between the HPT response and that dissipation test and the estimated horizontal hydraulic conductivity. So that is the one thing. If you do HPT, you do need to make sure that they're doing those dissipation tests if you want them to report the conductivity data rather than just the HPT response, like pressure and flow data. Thank you. Looks like we're out of questions from our audience, so we'll go ahead and wrap up just a little bit early today. I'd like to 